Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, as we continue to move right along through our study of this wonderful letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church uh, several thousand years ago, and yet still tr- such tremendous applications for all time and for us today in our church. Last week, um, we considered verse 12 of chapter 1, in which Paul began instructing how to have a true testimony, how to have your testimony very clearly shine through that speaks volumes about who you really are. And Paul used himself as an example in that. And we're going to continue along that theme for a few weeks now as the scriptures continue to unfold what a true testimony looks like. What type of concrete evidence is witnessed through your life that would lead others to know unequivocally that you are a child of God, wholly submitted to Him? That's a question that I want to answer this morning from the Scriptures. I hope that you'll examine yourself against the light of the evidence that we'll look at. Because in this text, Paul trotted out all the evidence that was ever needed to prove him guilty as charged of being a godly man. Now this isn't just evidence that he would verbally claim. And there are many who verbally claim to be Christians and that verbally claim to be obedient and submitted to the Lord. But this is evidence that others could clearly and consistently see and by which those others would be convinced that he was truly a child of God and a man of God. This is evidence that people will be able to see no matter what time or day of the week it is or what activities we are engaged in. People will be enabled to look at us and see whether we are what we really say we are. And so this this is going to continue to show us what it is to truly have our walk match our talk. The testimony of our lives is crucial as Christians because it plays a direct role in our ability to do missionary work right here at home. And I want to speak to that just for a moment as we unfold and, um, and introduce this topic today. How do we become a part of truly reaching people for the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing them into his kingdom? I know that this sounds simple, and it really is, but it is a plain reality that we continue to see through Paul's challenge to the Corinthians, and we'll see today. It doesn't start by going to a foreign mission field or by giving or raising a lot of money for those that do go. It starts with each and every individual member of a church having an intimate walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and displaying plainly to the world, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but hear these words, but Christ liveth in me. It's only then that we're able to be a part of what Christ desires to do in this world. He's the one who prompts the heart to give. He's the one who directs his people to those whose hearts are willing to hear the truth of the gospel. He's the one who prompts his people to share the message of the gospel. He's the one who gets the work done as they allow him to work through their submitted lives. And so working through them, Jesus Christ is able to make a lasting impact on all around them. Now, I'll tell you this. It is a joy to me, an unspeakable joy, to see the work that God has begun to undertake in the lives of the people in this very congregation. It's a tremendous joy to see people who once lived for sin, who lived for darkness, who lived for themselves, casting aside um, all those things, truly transformed, and bearing the image of Jesus Christ that has been formed in them as their identity. That's a powerful witness, folks. That's a powerful testimony. And so let me ask you this question. Is there enough evidence in your life right now for those around you to unquestionably convict you of being an unequivocating follower of Jesus Christ? As we look at today's text, We'll see that the evidence was so clear in Paul's life that it was unquestionable. Why was Paul such a great missionary? Because he was crucified with Christ, and that which was still alive was Christ living in him. 
And so in that respect, um, this is a bit of an introduction to our message today, but it's also an introduction to what we'll consider the next couple of days at our church retreat. We're going to think about some of these same things, so stay tuned for that. But Paul's life completely changed because he yielded himself, and Christ had him from that moment forward that he yielded himself. According to Romans chapter 15 and verse 18, he said that he reached the Gentile world, and it was a result of Christ working through him. That wasn't a brag on his part. It was just a statement of fact. He said these words, and we're in 2 Corinthians, so stay there, but this is what he said. He said, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and by deed. Well, one of those things that Christ accomplished through Paul was the church at Corinth. They were a direct evidence of a man who was wholly submitted to Jesus Christ. When that church began, Paul very quickly learned that when he preached the word of God, he made some enemies. In fact, he made a lot of enemies in that city. He made some enemies even in that church in some respects, as we understand from this study. Some of the things that Paul preached demanded a higher standard in their lives than some of them wanted. And they didn't want to submit to Paul's authority or really to the word of God and its authority. As a result, that church was enamored with the world. It was enamored with the way that the world does things. And it was upside down with problems. Because some of those folks resented Paul's authority. They were constantly trying to find any flaw that they could in Paul's character. And today we're going to see exactly what they did. Now, Paul had some plans that he had to change. And because he didn't do exactly what he had said he intended to do, even though he had a good answer for it in this text that we're going to look at, the people that didn't like what he preached unreasonably used that as an excuse to tear that man down. They had claimed that he wasn't a man of his word. And this has been a continual tactic through all ages, because if you, if you tear the man down, then you can justify tearing his message down, and then you don't have to live under any kind of authority at all. But Paul lived daily. This is really the theme that we're looking at. He lived daily with such a clear conscience that their accusations held no weight. And remember that we studied last week in verse 12, we saw what it means to have a pure testimony, and I'll read that to you again in just a moment. But I hope that you understand this. When you have a truly clear conscience that doesn't condemn you because it's informed by the Word of God, and you've been obedient to the Word of God, then you can face down anything that's thrown your way. The accusations that come, and they will come, they'll come and go. And you'll continue right on regardless of unfounded accusations. The testimony of a clear conscience is an indisputable and an undefeatable witness to the people around us. It's evidence that we're submitted believers regardless of accusations that come. Now this world, no matter how much it hates us, has to stand back and has to grudgingly take notice of a person that keeps his head up and keeps himself focused and continuing right on faithfully because he has a pure conscience. They may not appreciate it, but they at least have to grudgingly admit it. The world has to take notice of a person who has a pure testimony and is unbothered and unwavering in the face of unfounded accusations. Verse 12 says that. It's why he started off the text that we'll look at today in this way. It says in verse 12, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. I'm not going to take the time to preach that again like we did last week, but it's a very simple train or succession of thought. He's talking about how they were able to rejoice or, uh, or just uh, proudly um, allow their lives to boast of this fact. The, the testimony he talked about, it's like someone who is a witness in a courtroom. The, their own lives, their manner of living, their conversation, their lifestyle, that was what spoke for them. And 
a pure conscience, informed by God's word, knowing that obedience had taken place. And he said that they had had their conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Now, Jesus Christ was evidenced through Paul, which proved that he was exactly who he said he was and what he said he was. Now, I want to ask you one more time before we get into the text today. Is there enough evidence from Monday through Saturday in your regular walk of life to convince others that you are truly a transformed child of God, completely yielded and submitted to him? Is it indisputable and undeniable when any person observes your life so that they arrive at the undoubtable conclusion that you are a godly believer? Let's consider what God laid out through the pen of the Apostle Paul as some of the evidences of that reality. Now, there's a lot more um, in, um, in what we could look at than what's here, but we're just staying within the immediate context, all right? So I want you to see how Paul kept right on going faithfully as evidence of the fact that Christ lived in and through him. First of all, we can see this. I've got about uh, four points or so that we'll walk through in this text, and we're actually going to cover a lot of ground today, which is why I didn't read through the entire text right up front. First of all, he kept on, um, even though he was unappreciated. And, and the operative concept is that he faithfully kept on, continued on. Now, anybody who's a, who is truly a believer that's here amongst us today knows that not everybody rejoiced when they were saved. We talked about in the last hour the contrast between what heaven rejoices in versus what the earth rejoices in. Folks, the earth, the world, um, even family members, they don't tend to rejoice when people become children of God. If they're not children of God themselves, that does not delight their hearts. And one of the hardest things for a believer is that when he surrendered his, surrenders his or her life and heart to Jesus Christ, and nobody around them seems to appreciate the fact that they're a believer now. It's tough. It's a tough thing to, um, to have thrown back at you. And so in verse 13, this is what our text today begins to unfold. Paul said, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And I'll pause there for a moment to comment on that. When the Corinthians read Paul's letters, even though those letters were very tough and very pointed, they had no trouble understanding what he said in them. <clears throat> he wasn't trying to impress them with his eloquence. He didn't try to use flowery or fancy vocabulary in what he shared with them. He just shared his heart. He spoke honestly. He spoke plainly. He spoke transparently. He never used methods that would distract from the powerful and plain message that he was trying to get across. All preachers and teachers should be very careful in that respect. In fact, um, in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1, we saw a while back that he had said this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech. Paul was a transparent minister, even though he taught the deep things. And he did teach deep things, by the way. The apostle Peter um, wrote a little bit about that. He said in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's kind of just humorous to me to see the contrast between those guys. Peter a little bit more uh, rugged and, and just a man of the world. 2 Peter 3.15, he said, Our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, uh, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now, he didn't say impossible to be understood. He just said they're hard to be understood. They challenged Peter's uneducated mind a little bit. Paul had a deep mind. And he would take people deep. He would challenge them. He would stretch them. But he was still plain and clear. And I'm trying to make that point from this verse 13. His readers could understand what he was saying. He had no hidden agenda. What he wrote and said was laid out right in front of his hearers. Now in this verse, he called on those people, the Corinthians, to acknowledge his transparency and his sincerity. Now the Corinthians had read a lot of things of Paul. They'd read his life when he was with them. They knew good and well exactly who he was. It wasn't a mystery. And so there should have been very little doubt about his writings. But they had only understood and appreciated up to a certain point. Verse 14 adds a further thought. As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, 
even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And you can see from that that they didn't fully appreciate Paul. The phrase, ye have acknowledged us in part, hinges on the word acknowledged. That's found three times in verses 13 and 14. It comes from the Greek word epigonosko, which means to fully understand and receive something. <coughs> I apologize for my voice this morning, folks. Um, bear with me. Uh, but it means to fully understand and receive something. It, it's not just to be informed by what your mind has comprehended, but it is to be transformed as you take what has been comprehended and act upon it. That's epigonosco. Any person here amongst us may understand many things in your head, which haven't made the long 18-inch journey down to your heart and been really taken into one's life and then put into action. Now, be sure to understand what I'm saying here. These people, the Corinthians that Paul was addressing, they could comprehend what he had written to them. They understood it in that respect, but not acting upon it would keep them from epigonosco, um, the fullness of knowledge. That's knowledge. Um, knowledge is just something that's comprehended. Epigonosco or acknowledge or acknowledgement. That's what you thoroughly comprehend and act upon. That's real faith when it comes to the word of God. Faith is always active. Faith always involves obedience and application, not just acknowledgement of it mentally. Many people read or hear something and comprehend it on a factual level, but they show that they don't receive it and appreciate it because they don't allow it to dig deep into their lives and change their behavior. The Corinthians understood what Paul had said. In particular, Paul had told them in his third letter, um, and I understand this is 2 Corinthians, but it's actually the fourth letter that Paul wrote. So a letter prior to this one, Paul had told them in his third letter to deal with a man in their church, a particular man. They knew what they needed to do, and they hadn't done it. So at that time, it was only a partial acknowledgement of the message and of the messenger. You see, they didn't really appreciate Paul for who he was. They didn't understand the gift that he was to them. And so Paul wasn't bragging in any of this, but he made sure to point out in verse 14, we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours. But then he made sure to say, in the day of the Lord Jesus. And what does that mean, in the day of the Lord Jesus? Well, if we look at the context here, and then we read, 2 Corinthians 5.10, and we read 1 Corinthians 3.13. Um, he was speaking about an event that's called the judgment seat of Christ. It's a time when all believers will stand before God and be rewarded for that which they knew and allowed him to do through them, as opposed to just merely having knowledge but not acting upon it uh, by allowing him to do anything through their yielded lives. Paul stated that on that day, when God's children stand before him in the judgment seat of Christ, on, they, on that day at least, we're all going to start understanding and appreciating what and who God placed into our lives. Now, I'm being honest when I say that if there are any rewards for me at all on that day, I'm going to have to take most of them and give them to others that God placed into my life, even if I didn't appreciate them at the time. But one day in the day of the Lord Jesus, I'm going to see them for what they're truly worth. I'm going to rejoice in them. Hopefully, they'll rejoice in me. That's what Paul was saying here. Now, the saddest part is that they didn't appreciate Paul presently in that day when he was amongst them. They didn't appreciate his message. They didn't appreciate his God-given position. Now, mind-boggling though it may be for us, the Corinthians didn't appreciate the Apostle Paul and the gift that he was to them. Most likely it was because 
Paul loved them so much that he said the hard things that we'll look at later in this message. They only partially appreciated him and understood him at that point. They hadn't acted upon everything that he had said. And frankly, it showed that they hadn't appreciated the one who had sent him, which was God himself. One day they would appreciate him for allowing Christ to do the difficult things through them. But in the meantime, even though they didn't appreciate him, and that's the circumstances surrounding this, and even though he will spend the last four chapters of 2 Corinthians defending himself from the critics and skeptics in Corinth, he kept on keeping on, and that is the evidence that proves what he was really made of. Now, when people don't appreciate you, and they won't if you're really all in for Jesus Christ, folks, don't get bent out of shape. If your conscience is clear and your testimony is pure, one of obedience of God's word, then you'll keep right on. And that'll be the evidence that people will have to look on maybe even grudgingly, and say, well, it's undeniable. That person does love the Lord Jesus Christ. They're continuing in spite of the fact that they're unappreciated. And so the first evidence that Christ is living in us, in this passage anyway, is that we remain faithful regardless of man, regardless of man's lack of appreciation for what we're doing. The second thing that we can see um, looking at Paul as an example, is that he kept on in spite of misrepresentation. Not only will true believers be unappreciated, they will be misrepresented by those who hate the Christ in them. In verse 15 and following, Paul finally unveiled the incident that had taken place which had caused him to write nearly this whole chapter. There was a circumstance that happened for which they criticized him and they claimed that he was not a man of his word. And how many people remember our study back in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 7? You'd have to have a pretty sharp memory to remember that exact one. I'll, I'll refresh your memory very briefly. Paul had told the Corinthians that he had planned to come and see them on his way to Macedonia. And then he was going to pass through Macedonia, spend some time with the churches in Macedonia, and he was going to come back and see them again. That was his plans. That was his intent. That was the strategy he had laid out. He had stated that he was going to bless them twice in doing that. He intended to pick up a collection that they'd been taking up for the suffering saints in Judea. That would be on his second pass through Corinth. But he changed his plans. We find that as we piece everything together, and we did this together in the introduction to 2 Corinthians, Paul had sent Timothy to them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we find that Timothy had returned to Paul, and he returned with bad news. Timothy had told Paul that the environment in Corinth was awful. It was terrible. They were ripping Paul to shreds and attacking his character over what he had written to them in 1 Corinthians. It was not well received. Now, when Paul heard Timothy's report, he changed his plans. He left Ephesus uh, and the, the church planting and missionary work he was doing there. He traveled all the way over into Europe, went to Corinth to try to sort it out, only to be accosted by some of his opponents. Disheartened and crushed, he returned back to Ephesus and he wrote them the third scathing letter that we don't have. Uh, because of the conditions, Paul opted not to return to Corinth himself. Titus was sent as his messenger. Titus took this scalding letter to them. And for the fact that he didn't come to see them like he planned to, the skeptics who were looking for a reason to divide from him spread the rumor that Paul can't be trusted. He's not a man of his word. And that's what he's going to unpack in these next couple of verses. Now, they didn't care about the circumstances. They didn't even know why he hadn't come. They didn't care why he hadn't come. According to verse 12, they'd accused him of acting out of fleshly wisdom. Fleshly wisdom refers to how the flesh acts without regard for commitments or without regard for the well-being of others. Paul made it plain in this text 
that he didn't act that way. When he chose not to come, it wasn't because of some frivolous whim of the flesh. He wasn't irresponsible and immature that way. Paul said that it was his honest intention to come to them. Verse 15 says this, uh, chapter 1 and verse 15. um, And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before, that ye might have a second benefit. That was that which he had referred to back in 1 Corinthians 16. And to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. That was the plan. Now Paul's skeptics took that, and they accused him of being fleshly and shallow and fickle. But they did something further, and this is especially how they attempted to disparage him. They found an inconsistency, or at least what they perceived to be an inconsistency, and not even knowing or caring about the facts, they used that as leverage to tear down what he was saying in other, in other matters. They claimed that just as he was fickle in his choices, he was fickle in what he preached. So nobody should trust anything that he had to say. And Paul was responding specifically to that in verse 17 when he said this, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? In other words, with with those deliberate plans laid on to come there these two different times for these purposes, did I use lightness? And And I'll explain that word in just a moment. He asked another question. He said, or the things that I purpose. Do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? Now, he's going to provide an answer to those rhetorical questions right here in this text for us. They were silly questions for anybody who knew Paul and was willing to be honest about him. The word lightness, when he said, did I use lightness when I changed my plans? It comes from the Greek word alaphria, which means levity or fickleness of mind. He was asking if anybody really thought that he was flighty or that he was untrustworthy once he'd made a commitment to do something. He was asking if anybody really thought that when he said yes, that he meant no. Or that when he said no, he meant yes. Did anybody really think that Paul was that way? No, Paul was telling them, my word is my bond when I say something. If I tell you yes, it's going to be yes. If I tell you no, it's going to be no. That was his consistent character. When he said no, he meant no. He wasn't fickle, he wasn't hasty, he wasn't undependable in what he said or in his character. He wasn't just driven easily by any kind of circumstances that blew along. He was a man who lived very carefully under the lordship of Jesus Christ. His conscience and the testimony of his life bore witness to that. But there are still times that unforeseen circumstances come about. Sometimes God sends unforeseen circumstances that we don't plan for that changes some of the best plans we may have even in his service. Now, isn't it interesting how quickly negative, fleshly, immature people are when they perceive an inconsistency in somebody else's life? Even though they don't know the facts and have never bothered to even try and find out They'll quickly seize upon something and use it against another simply because their own flesh has a problem with that person. And they never give the benefit of the doubt. For people who walk in the Spirit and are led by God's Holy Spirit, folks, um, uh, uh, excuse me, for those who walk in that particular type of spirit, I don't care how gifted they are. Uh, If they can preach the gospel and they can hand out tracts while standing on their head, it means absolutely nothing if they don't love another brother enough to give him the benefit of the doubt and actually seek out the truth about things. (laughs) You, You know, one of the first signs of a believer walking in the Holy Spirit maturely is that he gives his brother the benefit of the doubt. We talked about that quite a bit last week, the sincerity and the transparency that should be obvious in the life of someone who is truly walking with God and in the light of his word. That's why, like Paul, it's so very important to have a pure conscience when people don't give you that benefit of the doubt. When you know that your conscience is not condemning you, 
And the Spirit of God is not convicting you because you haven't violated His Word. When your walk matches your talk, even though people don't appreciate who you are and misrepresent you because of a perceived flaw in your character, the fact that you keep on keeping on for the Lord is evidence that Christ is living in and through you. Why? Jesus had to do the same thing. He continually did the same thing. He continually received the same thing from other people. And when he lives in and through us, he enables us to keep on keeping on when people don't appreciate us and when people misrepresent us based on a perception that's often not even real or not even true. All right. So those are the first couple of evidences that we can see that were very clear from Paul's life that he was a godly man who is continuing on in the Lord's work despite, um, despite uh, uh, being unappreciated, despite being misrepresented intentionally by others. Thirdly, Paul was a man who kept on knowing that he was being validated by Jesus Christ himself. All right, now our defense, uh, my defense is Christ in me. That's where our testimony really comes from. Verse 18 says this. This is great stuff. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. Now, there's, there's actually no verb in the statement, but as God is true. If you have a King James Version Bible, you're going to see that the word is, is italicized. That means that it was added for linguistic clarity when it was brought across to the English by the translators from Greek. Um, the, the statement, but as God is true, it's uh, what, what's called a, a Hebraism. I'm going to talk about another one later. It was just a, a Hebrew way of expressing something. It's similar to verse 3 in this same chapter where it says, blessed or blessed be God in the English, but in the original Greek, it just said, blessed God or blessed the God. Those types of statements refer to the unchangeable character and characteristics of God himself. Now in our text today, when it says, but as God is true, the word true comes from the Greek word pistos. It's frequently translated into English as the word faithful. Folks, it means that God is true to his word. He is true to the scriptures. He's true to what he says. He never vacillates or changes. He's always true to his word. He never says yes, but really means no. There's no fickleness at all in the true and faithful God. He doesn't break his word. And since the God who is true lived in Paul, neither did Paul. Paul didn't break his word either. He was sincerely manifesting that forth from his life. The statement here is, as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay. Then he said in verse 19, for the son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among us or among you by us, even me and Silvanus and Timotheus was not yea and nay, but in him was yea or yes. You can see the singularness of the statement that's made there. The message of salvation by Christ that Paul preached to the Corinthians would never change. It would always be yea. Paul didn't preach one day, yes, salvation's in him, and then the next day, no, salvation is under the works of the law and whatever you can do for yourself, and then the next day, yes, salvation is in him again. <laughs> That's not what Paul did. That's not what he continued to do. It was always, yes, salvation is in Christ alone. That was it. That was the singular message. Now the phrase, um, <clears throat> um, in him was yea, or yes. That's in the perfect tense in the Greek, which means that it never changes. It continues on forever. It's always going to be that way. So Paul said this, Corinthians, my message is as strong as it's ever been. I'm not fickle in what I do. I'm careful in my yieldedness to Christ, to the words that he tells me to express. Why? Verse 20 says this, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. 
It's referring to all the promises of God, according to Paul's statement. In Paul's day, that would primarily be the Old Testament scriptures because much of the new was just being revealed and written at that time. Um, But every promise that God ever made focused in some way on Jesus Christ and was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They are yea in him. They are yes in him. The word yea in the Greek word was nigh. It's a, a primary participle or particle rather of strong affirmation. It's found 34 times in the New Testament throughout. It's, it's translated into a couple of other words as well that are helpful for us. It's translated as even so, surely, and truth. And sometimes people would say, truth, Lord, when they would respond to Jesus. And so those are the ways it's translated. But essentially the word means assuredly, absolute confidence. All of God's promises are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There's not one that slips by and isn't fulfilled. They're a done deal in him because he's God. Paul said of the absolute certainty of Christ fulfilling all the promises of God, note this phrase, it says, and in him, amen. Now the word amen is one that we're fairly familiar with. It comes from the Greek word, amen, spelled exactly the same way. Our English word, amen, is derived straight from that. It's transliterated um, right across into our language. It shows up in the New Testament as the word Amen, 51 times. And it shows up as the word verily, 101 times. It was constantly used by Jesus when he spoke. When Jesus spoke, he would frequently start whatever he was going to say with the word, verily, I say unto you. It's a very powerful statement that he would make. It was a direct claim that his words were absolute truth, that they were absolutely trustworthy. In our case, we frequently will end something with amen. Um, and, uh, and it means the same thing. It is a statement of recognition that that is absolute truth. That is the truth of God. It's absolutely trustworthy. And so for us, well, we don't, um, uh, we're not a, a Southern shouting church or anything like that. And we don't have a lot of people that even say amen during our services. And I certainly don't expect that. Don't ever say amen to something that a person comes up with. In this context, it's saying that amen is a reference to absolute truth of God that is assuredly fulfilled. And so in that sense, don't be afraid to say amen to what God says, to his statements. God himself says amen to his own words is what's stated here. It's an example that Paul was using to illustrate the, the, the reality and the trustworthiness of Jesus Christ who lived in him and therefore the character that Paul himself had shaped and was representing was the same. All right? The word establisheth here. Um, it is very important. We'll consider that as well. Since Christ is ever faithful to fulfill his promises and Christ lived in Paul, it was a guarantee that he was a man of godly character. Now, folks, <clears throat> the Corinthians were treading on thin ice in their brash claims about Paul because it was Christ living through Paul that they were really attacking. They didn't realize that. They didn't recognize that. They didn't appreciate that fact. Paul explained or expounded on that further in verse 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. It's amazing to me how blind some people are. If they want to know if a man is faithful or has integrity, they can just watch what God is doing in that person's life. Or what he's not doing in some cases. That's what Paul was saying. The word establisheth. He which establisheth us is God. The word establisheth means to confirm. God himself had confirmed Paul. Who were they to brazenly claim otherwise? And again, I'll I'll emphasize that Paul wasn't being defensive here. He was pointing to a reality that we should also consider as we shape our interactions with others of God's people. When Paul came to Corinth, God had confirmed him very plainly, very obviously 
before those people. God's not fickle. He hadn't changed his mind about Paul as long as Paul didn't do anything to disqualify himself from use. The Christ, who is always consistent to his word, was abiding in and through Paul. So who were the Corinthians to say that Paul was a man not consistent with his word? Not only had Christ confirmed him, he stated that Christ had enabled him. It says this, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. The word anointed doesn't refer to anything mystical. Um, the word comes from the Greek word creo. It means to rub or to be smear with oil. It was a symbolic ceremonial ritual from Old Testament times when the priests would be consecrated, visually identified and set apart to their priestly office. In the New Testament, that statement or that idea was used pictorially of God's empowering Jesus Christ. Same word here, four different times it's used of God empowering Jesus Christ. And then one time, this single time, it's used of God's empowering of Paul in the work that he had sent him to do. That's the only times that this word is used in the New Testament. Once again, it's a bit of a rebuke to the fleshly element of us that tries to slither out and take too much upon ourselves and begin injecting our own opinions toward or about those whom God was pleased to locate in a particular place, use, confirm, and empower to do some of his work in a church. That was what Paul was referencing. Folks, be very careful and humbly learn from what Paul was saying here. God had assigned him and enabled him to do some work among the Corinthians. They had been too immature and short-sighted to appreciate it. Paul made the point here that of everything he had done in their midst, it wasn't attributed to him, and he wasn't trying to take any kind of the credit for it. It was attributed to God. The Corinthians knew that. They knew that it had come from God. God not only confirmed him, but God had enabled him. And then he said in verse 22, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now these verses are often used to try to make some other doctrinal points about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and such at salvation. But in the strict context that Paul was speaking about, being sealed and given the earnest of the Spirit in his heart was clear evidence that he was of God and particularly that the work that he was doing was of God. It was part of his testimony that was clearly displayed for them to be able to see. And the fact that God had sealed them, that is Paul and some of his fellow workers that were doing this ministry, it meant that God had set his mark upon them, authenticating them and authenticating their work. That's what the word literally means. The fact that God had given the earnest of the Spirit to them was God's own pledge that these men were of him and that they were doing his work. Now, the Corinthians had not been recognizing that. They'd not been appreciating that, but it was a clear reality nonetheless. Now, Paul had a totally pure conscience. He hadn't done anything of his own might when he had been with the Corinthians. Remember, I started out with what he said in Romans. I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought. And so all the glory went to the Lord. The Corinthians may not have been looking at it properly before, but they really knew that. He was not bragging about what he had done. He was bragging on Christ. There was clear evidence of all these things in Paul's life. Since those skeptics wanted to accuse him and continue to come against him, he called God to the stand beside him as a witness. Very bold in doing this. In verse 23, he said, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you, I came not as yet unto Corinth. Paul had good reason not to go to them like he had planned, like he had promised. They didn't know this. <clears throat> now listen, folks, and, and understand this in your relationships. Always make sure you know all the facts. Always make sure you know all the facts. Don't let an assumption cause you to judge a brother in the Lord. You may be doing to him exactly what the Corinthians did to Paul. 
Paul said that his good reason for not coming when he had initially planned was to spare you. <laughs> I find in this that Paul was not some egotistical minister. He didn't say that because of the way that you're acting, you're not even saved as far as I'm concerned. It's not what he said. In verse 24, he actually said, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Now, Paul, the, the emphasis here from what I can see is that Paul was not replying in kind to what they were saying. They were saying, Paul's not of God. Paul's saying, I'm not going to reply that way to you guys. He wasn't reactionary just because they were disagreeable. He was very controlled. He was very objective in all things. Their position in Christ was well secured. And Paul wasn't there to threaten that. It's made plain in the statement, for by faith ye stand. But he made plain what he was seeking to do. He wanted to be a helper of their joy. And folks, what that means is this. Their actions weren't acceptable. And as Christ's apostle and preacher, he was addressing what was wrong and in need of correction. They needed to be addressed about some matters, but they needed to be addressed properly, not browbeating them for their immaturity and inappropriateness. And so what we're talking about at the moment here is that as we look at the testimony that was born out in Paul's life, it was Christ who validated his actions who authenticated the work that he was there to do. Paul was not what they perceived him to be. He was a man who walked with God, and there was clear evidence to prove it. He kept on when people didn't appreciate him because he had a clear conscience. He kept on when people intentionally misrepresented him and presented a perception that was totally wrong about him. He kept on because Christ, who truly lived within him, validated him. Now, how about you? Is that keeping you going personally? It's a wonderful thing to have a clear conscience with your sins confessed, walking with God and Christ vindicating who you are. The fourth thing that we can see is that he kept on even when he had to say the hard things. Here's a much neglected reality. Only those who truly love you will tell you what you need to hear. The world that does not truly love people will tell them what they want to hear, but not what they need to hear. That doesn't help anybody, folks. That's not the measure of a true friend. The measure of true love and of a true friend is one who's going to tell people what they need to hear. God's servants, when properly instructed by God's word, will love people enough to tell them the hard things. Paul loved these people even though they didn't appreciate him. He loved them even though they intentionally misrepresented him. He loved them even though they didn't like the standards of God's word that he'd preached to them. He was willing to tell them the hard things because he loved them. Now here's a very important balance that comes into all this. I'm talking about telling people hard things, not telling them things in a hard way. There was absolutely no flesh in Paul's message or in his method of delivery. He carefully evaluated, how do I best convey the truth so that it'll make the greatest impact on those that I love? He didn't want to be any type of hindrance to God dealing with them. Though his flesh may have felt like the proper way was to rush right down and confront the Corinthians and get in their face, he was mature and he carefully assessed what would have the greatest likelihood of success without his flesh being in the way. He didn't have a score to settle here. He didn't need to feel vindicated by winning an argument. Even though his zeal may have been totally sincere, he was wisely sensitive to the way that God could best work in their hearts. In this case, it involved him not being there at all. That was, according to his words, his way of sparing them. He wrote to them rather than coming to them because he had some hard things to say. Folks, there's, there's really no telling what it would have been like if Paul had gone there. He may have hammered them. They may have had more difficulty in humbling themselves. There may have been other things that got in the way. He chose not to go because it was not a fight that he personally had to win. He thought it would have been better 
if he wrote them and spared them some of the pain that a physical presence would have brought. Turned out to be an incredibly wise approach in what he did. Now, um, uh, the, the application of that as we think of ourselves, please don't extrapolate that into modern day quick instant messaging, firing text message back and forth rather than going and confronting somebody. That's not any different whatsoever. Sitting down and carefully writing uh, a hand penned letter that's well thought through. And of course, in this case, the Holy Spirit directly leading Paul and what he had to say to bring those people to repentance, it was crucial. It took a lot of effort. It took a lot of thought. It took a lot of personal care and heart to do that. And, and I don't want to misrepresent what he did and the way that we would do that modern day. It's really not any different. So he said that, um, that he spared them and he wrote them a letter and said, and that was his third letter that we spoke about earlier, the one prior to the book of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 2 and verse 1 says this. I'm actually going into chapter 2 here, right? We'll go a few verses in, stay with me, and we'll be done. He said, but I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. Now, every single time that Paul had been with them, it had been a sorrowful time because of their sin. He continued, for if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? He didn't want that kind of relationship. He said in verse 3, and I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. Here was Paul's heart. He had confidence when he wrote. He had confidence in them. He had confidence in the power of God's Holy Spirit through the words that were written to deal with their hearts. He gave them the benefit of the doubt. He was thinking in such a mature spiritual way that he was totally convinced that the Christ who indwelt those people would do his work, that they would respond the right way, and that when he was um, with them, when he arrived, it would be a time of joy and not a time of sorrow. But the, the whole matter still broke his heart. And I want you to see the heart of this guy. He hated to tell them the hard things. He wasn't somebody that was uh, masochistic and just loved to be in confrontations with people in, in some way. But he realized that he had to tell them the hard, the hard things. Verse 4 says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, now, folks, we don't have that letter, but evidently it was really tough because verse 4 continues, Not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Paul wanted them to understand how heavy his heart was. He didn't want them to be swallowed up thinking about how they had damaged him. He wanted them to understand how he had sincerely written with tears because he loved them so much. That's why he told them the hard things that were designed to bring them to repentance. What were the hard things? Well, it seems that there was one particular person who had been really the center of gravity for all the grief that was stirred up against Paul. Then others had jumped on the bandwagon and followed that influential person. Now, when, when Paul's letter came, it was read publicly to the church. And it's probable that the innocent members of the church didn't even know what was going on. That's how things, things tend to be in a church, by the way. Or, or I mean, hopefully it doesn't go on here, but, uh, but it does tend to be that way historically in churches. Those innocent ones had to hear the same hard message that the guilty had to hear. Paul was sorry that those innocent ones even had to listen to any of this. Now, by the way, that's also frequently how it is in churches. A church is a body. It, it ought to be in unity. And if one is out of order, it impacts all the other members of a church. And so Paul said in verse 5, <clears throat> But if any have caused grief, if any have caused grief, that's a reference to the specific guilty party, he hath not grieved me, but in part. And, and in that, Paul recognized that the whole church wasn't against him. He's just grieved me in part. That I may not overcharge you all. Here's the stark reality. A church member who refuses to submit to Jesus Christ, 
who will never give his brother the benefit of the doubt, who's always unappreciative of what God has given as a gift to his church, and who misrepresents others based on a perception. When he does what he does, he doesn't just hurt an individual that he's after. He hurts the entire church. He drags the entire church down. I wish all of us could come to understand very clearly we're not islands unto ourselves anymore. Those who were involved in this behavior were hurting their whole church. Everything that's done affects somebody else in a church body. It's a domino effect. And out of love for them, Paul was willing to say some things that they didn't want to hear. And instead of going to them and just blasting them right out of the saddle, he wrote to them because he wanted them to understand his heart fully. Then he believed that they were going to respond and that they would have a, a joyful rather than a sorrowful reunion. Now, we won't get to it today, but in verse 6, he's going to begin to show that they did discipline this guy who was causing all the trouble. And of course, in Corinthian fashion, they did it to the extreme. <laughs> we'll talk about that more later. But today's focus is on the evidence of one who is truly a servant of the Lord. Does he keep on when people don't appreciate him? Does he keep on when people intentionally misrepresent him based on incomplete knowledge? Does he keep on because Christ vindicates him? Does he keep on even though he has to say hard things to people that he loves? Folks, I've been there. I've been there. Even with turmoil raging all around, it is a calm and secure place to be if you're submitted to Jesus Christ and he is evidently working through your life. One more evidence that we're going to see next time is this, obedience. Obedience. That's plain in the life of a person that has a pure testimony. Paul wrote the letter that we're studying right now because the Corinthians did what they were asked to do. Let me ask you this final question this morning. If you were on trial right now, and, and frankly you are, you should be examining your own self against the, the evidence of Scripture. Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a child of God? If you are saved, is there enough evidence to convict you of being a genuine and submitted servant of God in all matters? Absolutely sincere, not turned aside by anything that is said or done towards you. If you're unappreciated and if you're maligned, do you keep right on sincerely serving the Lord or do you stop? You see, it tells you what your motives are and who you're really trying to please. Do you definitively have the witness of Jesus Christ's real, constant presence and his sure promises in your heart? Do you give the truth even when it's tough? And do you respond to the truth that's given properly even when it's tough? If the answers to those questions are yes, then you'll be equipped and you'll be anointed to reach the world for Jesus as a member of this church. If you're not, then something's terribly amiss. Would you examine yourself against the standard of God's word today as we consider to, continue to consider what it is to have a true testimony? I want to have a true testimony before the Lord.